Hi there, my name's Gary Turner, and I'm so grateful to welcome Whitney Johnson onto the discussion. Hello there, Whitney. Hi, Gary. It's great to be with you. Oh, thank you so much for joining me today. So some of the topics I was really interested to discuss with you were around some of our more human aspects of life, Whitney, things such as sort of courage, vulnerability, mindset, these sort of things. And I hope that's something you can join me on today. Mm, sounds really interesting and fun. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, look, as we get going, would you mind, for those that may not know you as of today, giving a bit more of an introduction? Who are you? What's your background? And what are you passionate about? All right. So how, how much time do you want me to take? A minute? Two minutes? Yeah, take, take, take up to five. It's fine. I think it's oh, good for okay. people to really get to know you. Okay. Fantastic. All right. So as I'm, my name is Whitney Johnson. I actually grew up in the United States, and but was born in Madrid, Spain, because my parents happened to be living there on this entrepreneurial venture. So I've always felt like I'm a little bit Spanish. Um, but I grew up in San Jose, California, and um, studied music all growing up. I played the piano. And when I went to college, I studied music. I majored in music. I discovered jazz after studying classical. Um, but then I graduated from college. I was married. My husband and I went to New York so he could get his PhD in microbiology. We needed to put food on the table and I realized, oh, this music major isn't going to quite work for me. And so I um, decided that I was going to go get a job and I went out looking for a job. The problem was, is that it was the late 80s. I was a music major. I was a female. So I started working as a secretary on Wall Street. If you've ever seen the film Working Girl, that was basically me, big hair and all. And uh, so I started doing this work, secretary, go to work every day and discover that, hmm, I've got all these people over here sitting next to me. They're all men. They're trying to open up these brokerage accounts. I'm like, I'm just as smart as these guys. And they keep saying things like throw down your pom poms and get in the game. And initially I was offended because I was a cheerleader in high school. But then I was like, you know what? I need to throw down my pom poms. And so I started taking these business courses at night, accounting, finance, economics, and was able to move from being a secretary to an investment banker, which rarely happens if you know financial services at all started to move up in investment banking. Then there was a, a merger, um, a shakeup. My boss gets fired. I probably would have been fired as well, except that I had high performance reviews and I happened to be pregnant at the time. And so they moved me, but actually shoved me into equity research. And um, that turned out to be a career maker. It was a great, great opportunity for me. And so I picked stocks for my company and um, worked my way up after eight, nine years. I was an institutional investor ranked analyst. And then I came across the innovator's dilemma by Clayton Christensen at the Harvard Business School. And I started having this kernel of an idea that this theory of disruption isn't just about products and services, it's also about people. Mm -hmm. um, about a year later, I ended up um, leaving, actually disrupting my Myself. I had just been a disruptor at the beginning of my career by walking onto Wall Street through the secretarial door, but now I was actually disrupting myself. And I became an entrepreneur. I connected with Clay Christensen at HBS and eventually, after a couple of years of figuring things out, floundering, lots of mistakes along the way, um, launched the Disruptive Innovation Fund with Christensen and we did investing for about five years. But then in 2012, I sold my stake and started to do what I'm doing now. So again, another one of those moments where people are like, you're out of your mind. Why are you leaving this? But I really wanted to chase this idea down that this idea of disruption that we think about this notion of a silly little thing can take over the world because that's what disruptive innovation is, whether it's the telephone to the telegraph or the automobile to the horse and buggy or Toyota disrupting General Motors or Netflix even just disrupting Blockbuster, now cable TV, the big aha that I was having that I really wanted to understand is, is that you can disrupt yourself. There's this thing called personal disruption. But the big difference is, is that with personal disruption, think about Lady Gaga, you are Toyota and your General Motors, your Netflix and your Blockbuster. You're the silly little thing and you take over the world. And so for the last six years, I've been chasing down that idea. I wrote a book called Disrupt Yourself, um, which helps you know when it's time for you to make a change and then a seven step framework for how to make that change effectively. And then last year I published a book called Build an A-Team that helps you as a leader. So Disrupt Yourself is for you, the individual, and then Build an A-Team is for you as a leader. How do you use this framework of personal disruption, the S-curve of learning framework as a leader to help your people love working for you as well as to lower your disruption score 
as a company. And so now the work I do is consulting and keynote speaking and coaching. And I am having, and a podcast. And I think that's how Gary, you and I connected. And I'm just having a ball. I feel like I've finally found what I am meant to do in the world. Oh, it's just such a first thing first, really, I have to say thank you, not only for the work you do, but your, your book, Building A Team, I read it over Christmas. And it stopped me in my tracks. And it stopped me in my tracks because I looked at my career and went, hmm, I've done that. Why, why, why do I keep getting a four year itch? And before <laughs> I read your book, I was like, that's why, it's because I'm bored. I need a new challenge. I need to jump my curve. But I genuinely did not see, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. You know, why is it I get this feeling that I'm ready to do something new, but I can't quite put my finger on it? But right. your book helped me see, you know, you disrupt yourself, but also build an A team. It was just, yeah. that's how I fit in the team. Or actually, that's why I'm no longer aligned with these people, because they want to stay what they're doing, and I want something new. So it's actually me that's the challenge, not necessarily them. So it's just a really good oracle for allowing you to really reflect. So thank you for what you're doing. It's brilliant. Oh, well, thank you, Gary, for sharing that. So in terms of the podcast as well, because it's just a brilliant podcast as well. I'm not, you know, I've got you on the podcast to tell you how amazing you are, Whitney, basically. But outside of that, outside of that, you know, I think that the content is so rich. And I think what's really powerful for me as well is that it's unlike most podcasts. And also your writing's unlike most writing. And what I mean by that is I see that we're on the edge of this moving from the old sort of world, more fear-based, more siloed, more sort of command and control, which was to some extent okay back in the day. But now we're moving to this knowledge work in collaborative, you know, tech-based world. And I think disruption is going to be critical, personally, to be able to make that shift. Is that something that you see? Was that intentional when you started to do this work? Um, I think the answer is probably yes and no. So if I, if I think about Sometimes people will ask me, well, why do you do what you do? And um, the, you know, yes, you need to put food on the table. And so there's always that functional reason for it. But like, that's why one works. But the reason I do the work that I do is that I know that people want to change. And I know that if we are willing to change, then with the um, pace of change in the world accelerating, we will be able to manage it. We won't be acted upon. We will be able to act. And so instinctively, I, the work that I do is about creating a structure so that every single person that comes in contact with this content is says, I want to change. I know I need to change. I know I will be happier if I change. It makes me emotional. I know I'll be happier if I change, but I'm scared. And so by having this structure, um, this framework, my hope is that for that person, for you who's saying, I want to do this, but I'm a little bit scared, Here's a structure that will make it feel a little bit safer to make that jump to do something new that you know in your heart that you need to do. That's brilliant. You know something, that for me speaks straight away to sort of the courage piece as well. And I wanted to ask you about that. You know, how, how, how much courage do you feel from your, working with your clients, maybe even from your own experience? Is courage a key part of making the leap from one curve to another? It is a key part. I think that we have to... We have to be willing to do something that's unknown and that is scary for us. I think, I think one of the things though that, uh, and I suspect this comes up a lot in your podcast, it doesn't mean you're not afraid. It just means that you're walking in the direction of what you fear. Um, you know, I, I was just listening. Or, in fact, I just shared a quote with someone on my team because there's something that I need to do that I've been kind of afraid to do. And she's like, I'm glad you're finally doing it. And I, it was like a Joseph Campbell quote that says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure that you seek. And so I think that it takes courage um, it doesn't mean you're not afraid. It just means that you're willing to walk in the direction of that courage. But one of the things that I do really emphasize, Gary, is that oftentimes when a person's at the top of a learning curve and they're like, should I jump or not? We tend to think, okay, well, if, if, if I were really a courageous person, I would be like, we let's jump, you know, let's, where's my parachute? Let's go. But we know from the research from Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, the loss aversion theory, that um, something has to be 2.25 times more attractive in order, what we're going to gain has to be 2.25 times more than what we'll lose. And so one of the things I frequently talk about with people is instead of focusing on all the good things that are going to happen, if you decide to jump to a new curve, if you decide to do something new, focus, yes, on that, but also focus on what bad thing will happen if you don't jump. If I don't jump, 
I will start to stagnate. If I don't jump, my children won't have a role model um, for what to do. And so if we can start to mix, have this amalgam of emotions of yes is exciting, yes this is thrilling, and if I don't do this, I will feel bad. If I don't do this, I will have regrets. You can get that potent combination of emotions pair that with what we know about loss aversion theory, that helps us make that jump. That's re it's really powerful. If it's okay with you, Whitney, I'd like to go back just briefly, as you introduced some of the disruption and how passionate you are about that, you spoke that it makes you emotional. Do you mind speaking about that a little bit? Does it, what, what, about, what about the work that you do makes you yeah. feel emotional? Um, I think it makes me emotional because I feel so deeply that every single human being wants to be better. Um, every single human being. So I, I ha I'll give you an example and then I, I will answer the question. I remember a few years ago when I was first introducing this learning curve idea of, you know, everybody's at the bottom and they move to the sweet spot in the top and then they jump to a new curve. I had a CEO say to me, oh, I've got people, they're not on a learning curve. And I thought, no, that's, he was frustrated and I, I completely got that, but it just wasn't true because everybody has, has a learning curve everybody has deep in their soul this desire to do better and 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 be better and to live their best lives and i think sometimes when we see a person who, and say well they don't have a learning curve it's because their head has been beaten against the wall so many times they've given up but they do have a learning curve and so knowing that each of us has this piece of ourselves deep 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 inside that wants to be better that wants to improve that wants to live a great life um, if I can help people in even a small way, that, that speaks to something deep for me because then I feel like I'm doing good and I'm a, I'm a person of faith and I think that um, every single person, if we can do good and bless people's lives, then we um, are fulfilling the measure of our creation and, and the role that we have on this planet. Oh, so, honestly, it's, it's so beautiful. And, you know, if I may nick a little bit of your feeling, you know, I feel that as well. And I think, I think there's something right now, as you look at Moore's Law and everyone's talking about exponential technology, I don't know what you feel, Whitney, but for me, I feel like we're on the cusp of exponential humanity. We're finally starting to realize that there's, there's something about us reconnecting right now. It's this freedom, this openness, this trust, this curiosity. There's something about us tapping into something we haven't tapped into before. Is that something you feel? Yes, yes, I love that so much, Gary. And it's something, it's so fun that you, you brought that up because it's something that's been kind of in my brain, kind of swimming around a little bit. But if you think about the law of physics, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So um, there's this opposition in all things. And so if we think about exponential technology, then if you, if you consider the law of physics, then by definition, then humanity is, is going to move at the same pace um, as the technology, which is thrilling. It's mm -hmm. truly thrilling to consider that we as human beings can can exponentially grow and develop and I, and um and you see a lot of that happening you know i just read um atomic habits by james clear in fact i had him on my podcast this idea of getting one percent better every day that's 37 times better in a year and he's got that wonderful s curve that i love so much but helping us just tap into the power like the amazing amazing power of our brains and what we can do um, and I think the technology in some ways is showing us that way because we're like well if I can create a technology that can do that why can't I take what I've learned from technology and how that works and help my mind do it very very thrilling oh, I, love, I, I, I love it I think what's also interesting is that sometimes we forget that we as humans actually created the machines so yes yeah, exactly. bright humans don't get me wrong but it's almost as if we're trying to catch up with something we've created, which is quite an oxymoron, isn't it, to some extent? Yeah, yeah. it is exciting. It's thrilling. And, you know, I remember um, about a year ago, I was in, uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and I got to tour the Tesla factory. And I just remember being in awe. I was just like, wow, this all came from the mind of a human being. And that was just so astonishing and exciting to me. Um, to see what was happening in that factory. And I'm sure, anyway, so, so yes, I agree. We forget that it all starts in our minds, our wonderful, potent minds. Oh, amazing.
just out of interest, in, in terms of your own sort of journey through disruption, you spoke about very impressive, you know, going from being, you know, as you say, a sort of assistant in finance right through to where you are today. What are some of the bigger challenges you've had to deal with or where have you had to be most courageous during your career to get to where you are today out of interest? Where have I had to be most courageous? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, well, let's, let's kind of walk through it quickly. I, I would say, so when we, you know, graduate from college, we moved to New York, um, that, I mean, I went because of my husband, but I think that definitely took some courage of, of um, starting on Wall Street and thinking, you know what, I, I want more. I, I think I can do more and taking classes at night um, and going after that. Although it's funny, I don't think of that as necessarily being courageous. It's just like I felt it was something I, I felt driven to do. I would actually even argue as well that when I was um, at Wall, on Wall Street, I'm working as an equity analyst, I'm institutional investor ranked in two categories and I jumped, I'm not even sure I would describe that as courage because it felt like it was an inevitability of something that I needed to do. So as I think about what has taken courage and there are probably some things that we can talk about that are happening right now if we, as we dive in on this, but a couple of things that took real courage for me was marrying my husband. Um, if I think about, um, you know, I met him, I, uh, we were in college, I liked him, I liked him a lot. My mom didn't like him. She didn't think, you know, she didn't want me to marry him. Um, my parents had not had a good marriage. And so in order for me, and I had all this stuff going on and I pushed him away, like literally our engagement was a misery. I mean, at one point he wasn't gonna marry me. It was just so bad. Um, Providence intervened. It was like, yeah, I think you should marry this girl. And so we did, but I, I think it took a great deal of courage because I, I saw my parents, I saw my parents that they didn't have a good marriage. My dad was a philanderer, he embezzled money. And it was in my brain, my husband was gonna be just like my father. And our marriage was gonna be just like my parents' marriage, which wasn't good. And so for me, that is one of the biggest disruptions I've done is being willing to do to marry him. And we've now been married for decades. Um, and it was the best decision I've ever made. I think another place was having children. Again, I was terrified to have children and we waited quite a while. Um, and, but I felt more me than ever. And so it's interesting that you asked this question about courage because I'm sure that there are places in my career where I've displayed courage and if we keep talking, I'll find something. But the things that immediately come to mind are in those emotional interstitials, interstitials, I'm not actually saying that word properly, anyway, um, interstitials, that's what I wanted, of, of, of the emotional and, and around relationships. Just, I'm, I'm actually really blown away. Firstly, thank you for being so open and vulnerable to share those stories, because I think that's the point. And I think that's what's so exciting about this exponential humanity that's coming. Our ability to talk like this, because if we just put it in the third person about work, or that leader or my next job role that's nice but it's not what it's about you know that what you just described is real disruption how do i actually deal with my fears how do i actually connect with another human being at a level that i've not actually done before i love that whitney it's just beautiful so thank you so much for sharing thank you um i did just think of a career one that i can share and and you you i think it would be interesting to explore because we were talking talking you know prior to getting on the phone or recording about my podcast but um, I thought of one actually that is kind of in my brain right now is that you know I on my newsletter I said okay we're going to do this online book club and you know I'm going to talk about a book that I'm reading once a month and then what I'm doing as a consequence of that book and I'm going to post on Instagram because I did the social media fast etc and so my colleague, um, Macy Robinson, who's our podcast producer, was like, well, I think you should go live on Instagram and talk about it. And I was like, no, 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 you know, like I want to make sure that everything works, like, et cetera. And this morning when I woke up and I was listening to Earl Nightingale, the, the greatest secret, and I was like, she's right. Like, I'm afraid and I need to not do this. I need to just be willing to get online and talk about the book and it doesn't have to be perfect and I don't have to look perfect. I just need to do that. And that scares me. So for me to do that, that takes courage. And um, so anyway, that's one thing that's happening real time that I just emailed her this morning. I was like, okay, let's do it. <laughs>
right actually before we got on the line together. Oh, th thank, you. thank you for sharing that. I think, I think for, for me, one of my big ones right now is actually, so I'm looking at doing this online summit around having courage. Uh -huh. And it's really interesting when you, you start, I don't know if you found the same, but you, know, you start a project, it's a nice idea, then you literally get up to that edge of the cliff and you go, oh wow, actually, this summit's gonna get emailed to 100,000 people. Oh, there's a really nice idea sitting in my little box at home, recording all these interviews, and it's like, oh my God, this is really gonna be a thing now. So I'm literally going through it real time as I talk to you. <laughs> You're having that, oh, this better be good, because a lot of people are gonna learn about it, yeah. It's gonna be great, Gary. I'm sure it's gonna, I, I, in fact, I am going to predict right now, it is going to be great. Well, I, you're, you're very kind. <laughs> but no, th thank, thank you for sharing your examples. So if we sort of move forward into, so I, I really want to stand this Disrupt Yourself theme because I think it's, it's been so powerful for me to learn where I've disrupted myself and also, also to have this system to follow. What do you find when you're dealing with your clients? You know, is, did you find that whether you're talking to a CNO, a CEO or a C-suite or just an individual on a one-to-one -one basis, this particular S-curve model, it does go across or genders or backgrounds. It's just a really holistic model. Is that how it shows up? Yeah, it does. And it's really, really fun. I mean, so you talked earlier about how like every year you get the four year itch and, and maybe just to recap for people quickly who are coming to this new, this is the idea of, you know, everyone's on a learning curve, including you. It's this S curve. It, it looks kind of like a roller coaster. So you've got the bottom and you have the steep part in the top. Um, the S curve was popularized by E.M. Rogers in 1962. I've reimagined this as a learning curve that um, whenever you start a new role, you start a new project, you start a new job, you're at the bottom of that learning curve. And what happens when you're at the bottom is it looks growth is slow. It, it's not slow, but it looks like it's slow because a lot of time's passing and nothing seems to be moving up. And so that helps you understand that when you start something new, don't get discouraged. It's exactly how it's supposed to look. And then you get to the steep part of the curve where the growth starts to explode. And this is where all your neurons are firing and you feel challenged and things are hard, but not too hard. And it's just the fun part of the curve to be on. And, and in very little time, a lot happens. And then you get to the top of the curve and now you know exactly what you're doing. You've mastered it, but because you're no longer enjoying the feel good effects of learning, you can get bored. And if you don't jump to that new curve, you can actually precipitate your own demise. So to give you an example of a couple of things that have happened happen as a consequence of people like, okay, I get this, like this makes so much sense for me. This, like you said, this is why I needed to jump. Not too long ago, I had a coach come to me and say, you know, I shared this, this framework with one of my CEO coaching clients. And he said, oh, that's why I'm so cranky. I'm at the top of my learning curve that's what's going on. I've had another situation where I had a, a chief technical officer. He has a person on his team, really, really good. And he was starting to get nervous. He's like, I'm afraid I'm going to lose him. And so he explained the S curve concept. And he said, so here's what's going on. You're at the top of the curve. We are committed to you. We want you here. What could a new S curve look like for you? And so that gave them an opportunity to open up the conversation. And so by everybody inside of an organization, knowing that everybody's on that S curve and after three or four years, it's going to be time to do something new, provided that they, you know, do the work at the low end and the sweet spot, it gives people a real language, um, both in terms of their own development, but also in terms of managing the people, um, especially when it comes to, to retention. I know. Brilliant. And do you think any, you know, one, of the, one of the themes I'm really passionate about is actually around inclusion. Mm -hmm. And do you find that the S-curve model that you've evolved, is that something that's helpful to help organizations be more inclusive by design? It's just something that comes to me in the moment, Whitney. I don't know if that's something that's a yeah, thing. I don't, I don't know either. So let's think about this for a second. I, I, I think the thought that comes to me immediately is I will frequently you talk about people saying you've got A players and B players and C players. Um, and I, I actually don't know that I agree with that assessment. I think that if you've got, um, which, which um, when you have an A, B, and C player, what happens? You get people who are in the in circle and people are in the out circle. Well, they're an A player, let's focus on them. They're a B player, maybe C player, not so much. And if you look at the S curve of learning, if you know that everybody's on a learning curve, then what does that tell you? It tells you that Assuming it's the right curve, because sometimes if you're at the low end and people aren't getting traction, it just turns out it's not the right curve for them. It doesn't mean that they're not capable. It doesn't mean that they're not 
willing to work hard. It's just, it's a bad fit. And oftentimes because people talk about what they do well, not with what they do best, they get hired into the wrong role initially. So assuming that you've got the low end, you're like, okay, this might just be the wrong fit. Let's move them somewhere else. Um, but it also allows you when they're at the low end to be patient. Um, in the sweet spot, and I believe that if you find people in the right roles, then um, in that sweet spot of the learning, everyone's an A player. And when I say A player, I mean they're fully engaged and they're fully contributing to the organization. It doesn't mean they're going to necessarily be the CEO, but if a person is playing a role that is critical in an organization and doing a terrific job, then to my mind, that is an A player. Where your risk comes is when you get people at the top of the curve who have historically been A players and now they're starting to get bored who can become B players. And so, um, so, so riffing on this a little bit, I think what it does is it, uh, from an inclusion perspective, if we think about kind of diversity, actually two ideas then. So there are no A, Bs and C players. They're just, you know, A players who are on the wrong curve or the right curve. That's the first thing. And then the second thing is it drives inclusion from a, it's a standpoint of you've got diversity of depending on where people are on the learning curve. Because not everybody is, you know, a master yet. Some people are figuring it out still and some people are really figuring it out. So that provides for diversity. The thing that I think is interesting about mm -hmm. inclusion, Gary, is that um, we tend to want inclusion until we're included. And then once we're included, then we don't want inclusion anymore. And so I think that it's really important for us to always be aware, okay, right now I feel included, but who doesn't feel included? Right now I feel excluded, why? And just know that at any given time, we're in and we're out. And so how do we minimize the in and the out for ourselves and for everybody around us? Well, that is a wonderful, wonderful reflection. It's really good, give, give me a lot of new, my neurons firing because yeah, if, if you think, if, if, if you take away job titles, you take away background and literally look at it from a point of view of where you sit on the curve, it could be a wonderfully powerful mechanism for just moving people around your organization, shifting people onto different curves. If you could just get rid of the ego and the job title and look at it purely from where do you sit on the S-curve, that could be transformational, Whitney, for me. Yeah, totally. And, and, and a lot of it's up to the senior management of just saying, look, we want, we, if we can get you on the right curve, you're an A player period, end of story. We're gonna pay you, we're gonna pay you well, but we just need to have you be in this place. And it's not about A, B, or C players because we believe that everybody's an A player. That's, that's so, so powerful. Cool, love that. What do you think, um, in, in, in terms of, just a couple of questions before we wrap up, Whitney. What are some of the, the more common areas where people that you've come across, maybe, again, whether you're coaching clients, CEOs, wherever, where do people tend to get stuck? if they're trying to jump a curve or they know they should be jumping a curve, but they're not doing it, you know, is it just fear? Are there other things going on for them? Yeah. So I would say, so for the person who's jumping, yeah, most, almost always it's, it's fear. They're, you know, at their top of the curve. Um, everything seems to be working, right? They're making plenty of money. They know how to do their job. Um, if they do jump, they're going to get people saying, have you lost your mind? Are you out of your mind? And so, um, and, and it's, and also just, you know, I don't know if I have enough money. I was just talking to a fellow the other day. He's like, I want to jump. And I'm like, well, why don't you? And he goes, well, I'm worried about money. I'm like, how much money do you have of savings in the bank? He's like, well, I don't know, six or seven years. I'm like, you can jump like six or seven years. That's a lot to live on. So I, I do think that that's the place that people get stuck. Um, and then the other thing I would say from a managerial perspective is that if you've got a person who's at the top of the curve, there's this like, well, I'll just leave them there because they're doing me a lot of good right there. And so as a manager, we get stuck because we start to get entitled. Like, okay, this is the way things will. They should always be. And we get stuck because we don't realize is that if we try to leave that person there for too long, they're either going to leave because they're bored or they're going to get complacent they're going to start doing a bad job. Um, and because they're afraid and complacent, then they're going to start, you know, think about they're at the top of the mountain. They're going to start hurling rocks at the people who are climbing the curve because they don't want to be upended themselves. And so I think that the big risk places at the top of the curve, both for you as an individual and you as a manager, and then the other high risk places at the low end of the curve um, of finding and hiring people who actually have the will to climb the curve. And then once we've hired them, 
do what we need to do to get them the training they need and, and create that scope so that they can, they can actually make progress up the curve. Wonderful. And I just want to, just, just want to wrap up, I, I guess, really by, you know, you've spoken already about the, you know, being vulnerable and stepping into that Instagram live recently. Do you have any, is there anything else on the horizon for you personally where you think you're going to intentionally be looking to disrupt yourself the next sort of one, two years? Is there anything on the horizon? Yeah. Um, I think the way, uh, another one is that, you know, I've got this, um, these ideas, you know, build an A-team, disrupt yourself. I'm working on a next book. I think the way that I'm really working on disrupting myself right now is, again, what's going on in my brain. Um, you know, I'm effectively now building a business. I'm gone from, you know, I'm doing a keynote here, et cetera, writing a book to, building a platform around these ideas that can go into corporations. We've got the learning curve diagnostic. And so one of the ways I'm disrupting myself is figuring out how do I lead an organization? Like I talk to people about this, but how do I become the CEO? And how do I make sure that everybody in my organization, I know where they are on their learning curve and I'm making sure I'm developing them because you know, talk is cheap. I can talk about this all day long, but am I actually doing this with the people who work with and for me? It's a big challenge. Challenge. It's an exciting one, um, and but it requires me to, uh, you know, clear out not cobwebs, but just make sure that if I see that there are things I'm afraid of or some sort of mental blocks, as I do the inner work to get rid of those, so we can continue to to plow ahead. Oh, that's wonderful. And sorry, I, I, I could talk to you all day, but I've got another question before we start to wrap it up. <laughs> um, I'm really interested because that last point you made is really important to me. One of the things I've learned the last six to eight months is the importance of stopping to allow ourselves to access consciousness, innovation, creativity within ourselves. Is that part of this journey for you as well? Is actually creating this huge oh, yeah. stop? 100%. 100%. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that. So over the holidays, I did a 10, 10 day social media fast. Mm -hmm. So I didn't check social media. I didn't post on social media. We didn't post a podcast, etc. And in doing that, around that time, I had some insights around how I wanted to be showing up on Instagram, for example. So that was the, the stopping. Um, I've been meditating probably for the last year and a half, um, which has also been incredibly helpful. And then every morning, um, which I've done for my whole life, but I have this really deliberate practice around what I'm reading, what I'm thinking about. I have accountability partners to help me do that. And those are all effectively ways that I'm stopping and reflecting about what it is I want to accomplish and how I'm going to get there and imagining that in fact, it is possible. So that stopping is, is a big, big piece of it. Wonderful. Well, look, uh, I, 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 like I say, I can monopolize your day all day, but I'm not going to do that. So how can people reach out to you, Whitney? What's the best ways to contact you? Um, the best way is if you want to email me, you can email me at wj at whitneyjohnson.com. Um, if you want to continue the conversation, if you want to take the diagnostic that I talked about of where you are on the learning curve, you can go to whitneyjohnson.com forward slash diagnostic. And if you want to listen to the podcast, just go to my website and you can listen and you can find it anywhere, but you can go to the website and find the podcast there. You've been an absolute joy. I really appreciate you spending the time, Whitney. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.